You've probably heard that when a burglar decides which house to target, they start by casing it. This means that they watch the owners, find out information about their routine, and determine the best time for entering their home. By the time they're ready to commit the crime, they already know for sure when there won't be anybody inside or when the owners will be distracted. One of the tricks thieves use to gather information about your routine is so simple that you may not even give it a second thought. But the next time you hear a quiet crackle under the sole of your shoe, stop and check what it was. The chances are high that you'll find yourself face-to-face with a crushed cookie. If that's the case, it's your clue that something has gone terribly wrong. The thing is, this is a rather effective tool criminals use to find out if you've left on a trip or when exactly you come home in the evening. A cookie is such an innocent object that people don't usually give it much thought, if they even notice it at all. You arrive home, step on the cookie, make it crumble, and automatically reveal all your secrets to burglars. They know for sure if the house is lived in and can also figure out the schedule of its owners. Things get even worse if you're away from home. The cookie under the doormat remains whole, thus alerting criminals that the house is perfect for a break-in. So, if you find some treats under your doormat, that's pretty bad news. Someone is interested in your house and watching it. It might be a good idea to notify the police or take some safety measures. Now, the ploy with a cookie is just one of the numerous tricks used by burglars. One more sign that can alert you to the fact that you're being watched is white pebbles left near the house or in the driveway. This means that a criminal has already visited your home and marked it as worth entering. Another reason why thieves may have left the pebbles is to indicate that your house stays empty during the day. So, if you're walking along the street and notice a USB flash drive sticking out of a curb or a wall, don't get confused. You have most likely stumbled across a dead drop. Despite its ominous name, this is a global art project that has borrowed some tricks from the world of spies and espionage. Lots of people who know about this project are happy to be able to put on their black coat and dark sunglasses and go to swap confidential information with others. The thing is that many decades ago, spies had their own ways to exchange secret materials. There was a live drop when spies met in person, but this was often extremely dangerous. That's why a dead drop system was invented. In this case, some loose bricks in a wall in an alleyway hid important documents that had to be picked up later. Nowadays, there are more than 1,500 dead drops all over the world. And the accumulated data on these flash drives reaches 10 terabytes. You can come across a dead drop on any continent you visit, except Antarctica, maybe because there are not so many walls there. So if you find one, what do you do with it? First of all, it's highly inadvisable to connect random USB flash drives to your computer. You never know what viruses are lurking there, looking forward to destroying your hard drive content. And while risk is a part of the game, don't overdo it. If you're 100% sure that you want to play, secure your computer as well as you can, or even better. Secondly, you can't even guess what information will be waiting for you on a flash drive. Anyone can download videos, photos, or text files, and this has already led to several problems. Speaking of which, have you got a parcel with a USB stick in it? Whatever you decide to do with it, don't plug the flash drive in. Such cases have been more and more frequent in Australia. The police warn people that hackers have invented a new tactic. They drop unmarked memory sticks to letterboxes. It'll probably come as no surprise that these devices contain malware able to mess up your computer. They evidently rely on human curiosity and, in all honesty, it pays off. People can't fight an inexplicable desire to check the contents of a mysterious gift. As a result, almost half of USB sticks received by post get plugged in. After that, people start having serious problems with their laptops and computers. For example, fraudulent media begins to stream service offers, or computer viruses harm files and programs on a PC. So, no touching the free flash drive, okay? Now, you leave a shopping mall, your office, an airport, and go to the parking lot to find your car. You unlock it and put the key in the ignition. When you're about to start your vehicle and drive away, you see something strange on your windshield. Is that a $100 bill wrapped around your wiper? Oh, you could certainly find a way to spend this unexpected gift. 
But do you really think someone accidentally put money on your windshield and forgot all about it? Beware, this is nothing but a ruse. Because, as soon as you get out of your car to get a closer look at this mysterious banknote, the owner of the banknote will take action. They will get into your car and drive off at a record-breaking speed. Let's admit that no one would turn off their ignition and take their belongings with them if they got out of their car to check the windshield for a C-note. As a result, in under a minute, you'll lose your car, your wallet, and your documents, and you'll be left stranded in the parking lot. People have recently started to find some article of clothing, like a shirt for instance, lying on their windshield or wrapped up in their wipers. If you ever happen to be one of these people, don't fall into this trap and don't try to remove the object. Just get in your car and drive away as fast as you can from the place you were parked. This seemingly misplaced garment is actually a new con being used by muggers and thieves. It works like this. If you see some random piece of clothing that prevents your wipers from moving or obscures your view, your first reaction will be to remove it, of course. But while you're distracted untying it or trying to get it off, the criminal has plenty of time to jump you. The most common place for this sort of scam is parking garages. They're usually badly lit and pretty deserted, which means there are few witnesses around and plenty of dark spaces for the attacker to lie in wait. Now, if one day you come home and notice some graffiti or markings on your door or house, call the police immediately. Even if it just looks like a teenage prank or a simple scratch, it's better to be safe than sorry because burglars use certain marks to tell other criminals different things about your house. For example, something resembling a Roman numeral 2 means that the homeowners are rich, so the place is a great target. On the other hand, a crossed circle tells other burglars that there's nothing valuable to take from the house. Hmm, kind of makes you want to mark your own house like that. Now, a long horizontal rectangle divided into four parts means the place has a big aggressive guard dog. A triangle divided into two parts by a vertical line tells criminals to hit the place only at night while a reversed one says that a house or apartment is free after dinner. And something looking like a combined A and K lets their fellow burglars know that the house is always full of people. Hey, did you know there's even a fraternity for burglars who love to steal desserts named Iota Grab a Pie? <laughs> Sorry I made that up. A new trick being used by car thieves, and that's the trick with a coin. They slip it into the space between the door and the door handle. When a car owner thinks they've locked the door with a remote, the vehicle is, in fact, still open. The coin prevents the lock on one of the doors from working. As soon as the owner walks away from the car, the thief has no problems at all opening the door and driving away. Another trick. As soon as there's some public gathering, a big party, or even a busy day at the mall, car thieves make an announcement over the PA system that a particular car, chosen by them of course, has blocked their vehicle in and they can't leave. As soon as the owner comes out to move his car, a group of guys start to act. They assume, and for good reason, that the person is carrying the key to his car. Listen up, you might live through this video. You know, in every survival movie ever, characters get inside a cave and start a fire to warm up. It might work on the big screen, but you should never do it in real life. Soon enough, the fumes will fill the cave and you'll have no air to breathe. The safest thing you can do is start a fire at the back of the cave. Don't rely on two sticks to instantly start the fire when you need it the most. Yes, friction works in theory, but honestly, you'll need some practice and patience to be able to do it. Now, if you run into a bear while hiking, pretending you are no longer alive won't always save you. If you're dealing with a black bear, you'll need to fight back for your life. A brown or a grizzly bear will normally warn you first before attacking. So you'll have a chance to back away slowly or lie on your stomach with your hands over your neck to show you're not dangerous to the bear or its cubs. Your chances of being attacked by a shark are 1 in 3.75 million. But if it happens, don't even try to punch it in the nose. Movie characters might do it without a problem, but you're unlikely to hit that moving goal. Instead, try to put some solid object between you and the shark. If that doesn't work out, claw at its eyes and gills. You might need a bigger boat. This black, ominous-looking snake won't hurt you, 
it's got no fangs. You may have mistakenly thought that this black critter is none other than a black mamba, but it's just a harmless rat snake. There's one main sign that can help you figure out if a snake is really dangerous. Unfanged species do not have a venom delivery system, therefore, their bites won't harm you that much. But if you see a snake with fangs, you're in real danger. Future rock climbers, this one's for you. Don't tie a rope around your waist if you're trying to keep safe from falling. It might stop you from hitting the ground, but it can still hurt you badly inside and even break your back. Instead, use a safety harness that goes around your hips and legs. Boiling water from any nearby pond or puddle will not make it crystal clear and 100% safe to drink. This way, you can't be sure you remove possible harmful toxins from algae blooms or chemical contaminants. So instead of enjoying a refreshing drink, you'll have to spend some time in a forest bathroom, or worse. Consuming random berries in the forest is dangerous. First, you need to check if they smell okay. If they have a pear or almond smell, avoid them. Next, get one, rub it on your forearm, and wait for 15 minutes. If your skin starts to itch, hmm, don't eat those berries. If you bite on a berry and it has a bitter, tingly, or soapy taste, spit it out. So hydration is a must no matter the weather. But the idea that drinking hot liquids will warm you better is a myth. No amount of hot liquid can raise your body temperature. Plus, you can drink cold water faster than a hot drink, and that will help with hydration. A cactus can't be your source of water either. There are only a couple of species that are safe for drinking. But if you can't recognize them, it will get you in trouble rather than satisfy your thirst. The liquid you can take from some random cactus is often highly acidic and can give your tummy a really hard time or even paralyze you. Don't rely on your nose grease as a perfect fire starter. I mean, I don't think there's enough oil on your nose to make a bow drill spindle slippery unless you are Shrek himself. Plus, when trying to start a fire by rubbing sticks together, you'll get more sweaty than oily. And sweat doesn't help at all. Now, if you ever get stuck in a forest fire, don't try to hide in a cave or a big hole. You could run out of air fast. Instead, try to run through the fire to the burned-out area. Cover your eyes, face, and airways. Cover as much of your skin as you can with clothes or anything else you have. Look for a path with fewer obstacles where the fire looks smaller. Take a deep breath and run fast. Make sure you keep your mouth and nose covered so you don't breathe in the hot air and smoke. When you're chased by some predator, never jump off a cliff into the water. This is much more dangerous than meeting the predator. If you jump from a high place, the water surface will feel as hard as concrete. Or the water might be too shallow and you'll hit the bottom. A sudden strong smell of fish in your house may mean an electrical fire has started in some room. Your socket or adapter is on fire, emitting this unpleasant odor. Using regular baking soda is a good way to put out a fire. If you don't have a fire extinguisher or access to water, sprinkle the fire with this powder. Also, this substance can hide your smell from predators. It's helpful if you've gotten lost in the forest and don't want wolves or bears to smell your scent. Use ordinary charcoal and a plastic bottle to clean dirty water. Cut off the bottom of the bottle and close the lid slightly on the upper part so that the liquid pours out in a thin stream. Put the coal in there and add some water. Let it pass through the charcoal several times. Then heat and boil the water. Now you can quench your thirst. Even if you get super hungry in the wilderness, don't eat whatever birds and squirrels are snacking on. If they eat it and survive, it doesn't mean your tummy will tolerate the same berries. Before going to the wilderness, remember several types of berries that grow in your region. The general rule is that green, yellow, and white berries are mostly poisonous. When lost without a compass or other navigational devices, don't rely on moss too much. You must have heard that it always grows on the north side of a tree. Actually, it can grow on any side, depending on where conditions are best for it. So you definitely won't find the right direction if you use it for orientation and will get even more lost. 
When stuck in the desert, you'll naturally want to take everything off to feel a bit cooler. Well, stop right there. If you let the sunlight touch your skin, you'll get a sunburn and speed up dehydration. Cover as much skin as you can from direct heat and try to maintain a normal body temperature. So, don't try to bring your wet matches back to life by drying them up. Their heads have chemicals that can get ruined by moisture. When you strike a match, the friction between it and the glass powder on the striking surface of the package creates heat. If match heads get too wet, the chemicals won't work right and the match won't light. So get waterproof matches or keep your matches in a waterproof container. If you don't have those, you'll have to go back to good old friction and tinder. Snow isn't a replacement for water. In any amount of snow, there is about 9 times more air than water. Eating snow can make you very cold inside, and you could get hypothermia. Plus, your body will have to work harder to heat the snow and melt it, and you'll get more dehydrated than hydrated. So always melt snow before drinking it to stay safe. Pepper spray is good for self-defense, but if you're afraid to use it, you can keep a bright flashlight in your bag. Point its light in the robber's eyes to scare them away. Besides, this way of self-defense won't harm the robber, and you won't cause any unnecessary problems. If you leave a frying pan with oil on a turned-on stove, the oil may catch fire. In this situation, extinguishing the flames with water will be a big no-no. Water molecules will descend to the bottom of the pot, evaporate, and push the oil up. This will lead to even more flames. The best way to put out a hot oil fire is to deprive it of oxygen. Cover the pan with a lid and remove it from the burner. Flames are not the scariest thing about a fire. Smoke is much more dangerous. You can get poisoned very quickly by inhaling carbon monoxide. Therefore, always try to stay as close to the ground as possible and cover your mouth and nose with a wet cloth to filter the oxygen. Always put a small mirror or whistle in your pocket when you go camping. These two items will help you find your group if you get lost. The whistle will attract others' attention with sound, and the mirror will do it by reflecting sunlight. When you're swimming in the sea or ocean near the shore, there's a risk of getting caught in a riptide. An undercurrent will pull you further and further away from the beach. Don't try to swim to the shore against the current you will only waste your energy. Always swim parallel to the shore in such cases. Once you escape the current, you can safely return to the shore. Imagine that your cotton clothes are great in almost any situation, but not for hiking. When cotton gets wet, it loses all its good properties and can make you feel much colder. Choose clothes made of polyester, nylon, or merino wool. Unlike cotton, these materials move sweat away from your skin and dry quickly. Sucking on stones won't help you quench your thirst. Yeah, the popular myth says that when you do it, your body produces more saliva, and it will hydrate you. Well, in real life, nothing can replace water, and you could choke on the stone. Don't even think about rubbing frostbitten skin. Frostbite happens when ice crystals form in your skin and other tissues. Rubbing the area makes it worse, because the ice crystals can cut and damage new cells. Instead, gently warm up the frostbitten area. Alright, a lean-to isn't the best shelter for any situation. If it's really hot, you need shade to stay cool. But if it's cold, you need to stay warm. Duh! This means blocking the wind and having something to keep you off the cold ground at night. A lean-to can block the wind and rain, but it might not be enough to keep you warm. Ah, raw meat. It's safe to eat when it's high quality and processed with sanitary standards in mind. So, unless you're a chef who brought some tartare on the hike, don't eat raw meat. It can be risky, because it might contain germs that can make you sick later on. One roof is not enough to protect you from all evil, and you'll waste way more energy than you think trying to build it. So, instead of focusing on it, Try to build a comfy bed using sticks, leaves, or old newspapers. This bed will keep your body heat from escaping into the cold ground. 
Every car has a thermometer, a device that shows you the temperature of air outside. Sometimes, manufacturers put its sensor behind the front bumper, near the engine. While driving, the thermometer gets heated by the engine and shows you a higher temperature. Even if it's freezing outside, the device can indicate that it's warm. Therefore, don't trust the thermometer if it's installed this way. What if there's some ice on the road and you're driving completely sure that the asphalt is dry? You don't have to stay away from a person who has been hit by lightning. They won't shock you. And they really need medical help. So check for the pulse and make sure you call the emergency services for them. Now, quicksand isn't as dangerous as you might think. It's a myth that if you get trapped in it, you should stay still and wait for help. What you should do is lean back and make forward and backward movements with your body to wriggle yourself out of trouble. You shouldn't really suck the venom out after a snake bite. This way, you'll just get more bacteria into the open wound and risk your life, too, if you're the one trying to help. Try to stay as calm as you can in such a situation to reduce your heart rate and slow down the spread of venom. Call 911 and remember the size and color of the snake to give these important details to the doctor. Okay, stay safe. When you're out hiking in the bush, remember not to mess with any snakes you come across, even if they don't seem alive. Some sneaky snakes play possum and can strike if bothered. If you spot one, give it some space. When it comes to snakes, they're usually pretty shy and won't bother you unless they feel threatened. Trying to catch or harm a snake is a big no-no, as that's when most snake bites occur. And don't be tricked by their size. Even little snakes can pack a punch. For example, baby brown snakes are born with venom, so it's best to admire them from a safe distance. Each year, over 7,000 Americans fall victim to snake bites, often due to misguided attempts to handle or fight a snake. It's crucial to avoid such actions and seek immediately medical help if bitten. Understanding how to differentiate between venomous and non-venomous snakes is key to assessing potential risks. Contact a professional if you're unsure about a snake's identity and never handle a snake, even if it appears harmless. If you come across a snake, it's best to leave the area and seek assistance from a wildlife professional in identifying the reptile. Here are some tips to help you distinguish between the two types. Observe their behavior, nesting habits, and habitats. Some snakes may shake their tails as a warning signal. Also, venomous snakes typically have triangular-shaped heads, compared to non-venomous snakes with rounded heads. Here's another venomous star, the copperhead snake. Their musk smells just like cucumbers. Their venom is pretty particular too. Will you be in trouble if this snake bites you? Totally. Does it help cure lethal conditions? Um, sorta. It's not a 100% proven fact so far. But scientists have been testing this theory for quite a while, and they did notice that the copperhead snake's venom can, if not cure some serious conditions, but slow down their progression. Even so, they have the most venomous bites among all the US snakes, but antivenom for the bites somehow is not always needed. Coral snakes are known for their non-aggressive nature, as they are shy and secretive creatures. Theirs make up less than 1% of snake bites in America. Their venom is a neurotoxin that paralyzes nerves, and due to their small teeth, they must chew on their prey to inject the venom. When feeling threatened, a coral snake will curl the tip of its tail to confuse the attacker about the location of its head. Now, if a leech attaches to you, never burn it off. This can cause the animal to basically throw up directly inside your skin and cause massive infection. Try using a credit card to break the seal and remove the leech. Or if you're brave enough to wait for an hour, the parasite will fall off once it's fed. If a power line falls near you, you should run away. Electric current is now everywhere on the ground. When it comes into contact with one leg, it passes through the person's body and exits through the other leg, thereby hitting the whole body with a powerful charge. Always take some gum with you when going to the wilderness. If you get lost, Chewing gum will help you relieve stress. You can also use this material as glue. 
always keep your car keys next to your bed. If a thief enters your house, use the keys to turn on the car alarm and scare the thief away. But installing a good security system in your home is even better. While skiing or snowboarding, there's always a chance of getting caught in an avalanche. If you find yourself under a layer of snow, don't try to get out immediately. Your mind is confused, and you need to know where is up and where is down. Spit and see where the saliva flows. Then start digging in the opposite direction. When your plane makes an emergency landing on the water, your instinct can force you to put on your life jacket immediately. Don't do this until you're in the water. If you put on the vest and water starts to fill the cabin, it will be difficult for you to move. So get to the emergency exit first, then put on the jacket. If you start feeling unwell in a crowd, don't ask all the people around for help. Most likely, no one will help you. Not because people are bad, but because every person passing by will think that someone else will help you. But if you choose one person and ask them for help, you'll have a better chance to get it. GPS is not the best navigational tool. It's reliable and easy to use, but it can break down. So you should learn how to use a map and a compass. They won't let you down if you know how to use them correctly. You shouldn't swim parallel to the shore if you find yourself in a rip current. Instead, try swimming at an angle away from the current and toward the shore. Remember, you shouldn't feel too much resistance while swimming. Following birds to find water is a myth. They could be flying anywhere. Land animals like deer are a much better option. They usually know where the source of water is. When you feel someone is following your car, make four right turns. This way, you will make one circle around a block. And if the car is still following you after that, drive to the nearest police station. While walking outside, you may notice or feel hairs on your head starting to stand on end. Look for shelter quickly. Lightning is about to strike you. Service dogs are wearing special jackets with the inscription service. If such a dog approaches you, you need to follow it. Perhaps you will save someone's life. If a person gets in trouble and no one is nearby to help, the dog will start looking for someone to save them. During a fire, the flames spread more slowly if the doors in the room are closed. So when you go to bed, close the bedroom door. It'll hold the flames for a while. But don't forget that it's always better to have a good fire alarm. Tornadoes move fast. So if you notice a vortex that seems to be standing still, you must run. It means the tornado is moving right towards you. The smell of gas in a room indicates a leak. Therefore, don't turn on the light. The smallest spark can set the whole house ablaze. When you scratch a person, their DNA remains under your nails. This can help you in case of an attack, especially when the robber has run away and you want to help the police find them. If you've disturbed a hornet's nest or a beehive, run in any direction as fast as possible. Sooner or later, the insects will stop chasing you. But if you jump in the water, they'll wait until you get out. Some so-called survival experts claim that in a critical situation, when you're out of water, it's okay to go number one and then drink this, you know, nature's lemonade. Well, listen closely. That's nothing but an extremely dangerous myth. Not only is it gross, but it won't quench your thirst either. Even more, you're going to experience the opposite effect and get dehydrated at a much faster rate. You see, this bladder brew is the last step in your body's attempt to get rid of waste. No wonder it's brimming with waste products, which you should, by no means, reintroduce into your poor dehydrated body. However, it works just like water when you want to cool your body temperature a bit. Hmm. Feel free to use your yellow rivers to dampen your clothing in case you want to freshen up. Another popular myth about hydrating your body speaks about sucking on a stone if you end up dehydrated. Well, while it's sort of true that sucking on a stone can help stimulate saliva flow, it's actually an ancient survival technique that people once used worldwide. 
but it doesn't provide actual hydration since, obviously, you can't get any water from the stone itself. Moreover, there is a risk of accidentally inhaling the stone if it's small and it can potentially lead to choking. And finally, you never know what this stone experienced in life before you somehow decided to suck on it. Now, you might have heard that moss grows on the north side of trees, and you can use this knowledge to navigate through a forest. Well, I must disappoint you. Contrary to popular belief, and to what is often depicted in cartoons and movies, moss doesn't consistently grow on the north side of trees. The growth of moss depends on the species and the local climate. It thrives in areas where conditions are the most favorable, and it has nothing to do with the north or south. So don't rely on this rule too much. So space blankets actually do work. Despite their thin, trash bag-like appearance, mylar-coated emergency blankets can indeed keep you warm. The key lies in their aluminum coating, which is thermoreflective. This allows the blanket to reflect infrared energy and retain heat. If you're experiencing shock or exposure, your body loses heat to the air, and it leads to a drop in body temperature. A space blanket helps prevent this by keeping moisture in your clothes and reducing evaporation, which in turn limits heat loss. Wrap yourself in one of those tinfoil-like sheets and you'll stay much warmer. Another plus, these blankets are compact and affordable, so don't forget to throw them in your backpack before heading out. Now, loads of people think that when they're lost outdoors, they need to find food first. That's a dangerous belief. In this kind of emergency situation, prioritize water and shelter over food. A study from 2009 indicates that humans can survive up to two months without food and between 8 to 21 days without both food and water, even though this number varies based on individual and environmental factors. In survival situations, finding water and shelter is far more critical than getting food. In harsh conditions, you might only last three hours without adequate shelter and three days without water. If you have water and shelter, it significantly increases your chance of survival. Unfortunately, there are also many misconceptions about treating hypothermia, like the statement that a hot tub can cure this condition. Now, it's true that rewarming is essential when dealing with hypothermia, where the body's core temperature drops below the normal 98.6 degrees. But placing a hypothermic person into a hot tub can cause extreme pain and may even trigger a serious health condition, like a heart attack. Instead, put hot water bottles under the person's armpits or use skin-to-skin -skin rewarming. Avoid using high heat sources. They can be extremely harmful in this situation. Another myth connected to hypothermia is that you should let a hypothermic person ah! sleep. In reality, it's crucial to keep them awake while warming them up. Symptoms like shivering, confusion, slurred speech, and clumsiness indicate severe hypothermia, and drowsiness can follow. Allowing a hypothermic person to sleep can be dangerous, potentially leading to the worst possible outcome. Stay alert and make sure that the person remains conscious while you're warming them up. Hmm, how about feeding a hypothermic person? You may have heard that you should by no means do it, but this is actually false in mild to moderate cases of hypothermia. The treatment for hypothermia differs from that of normal shock. Feeding someone in shock is dangerous because they might throw up and choke if they lose consciousness. However, in moderate cases of hypothermia, small, repeated doses of high-calorie foods are beneficial. Such foods generate metabolic heat, helping the hypothermic person regain their ability to produce body heat. Now, when lost in the wilderness, you can eat anything animals eat. Well, hold on, it might be one of the most dangerous survival myths. 
Although humans share some biological similarities with other animals, there are significant differences in our dietary tolerance. Some plants that are safe for animals can be extremely dangerous for humans. Birds, for example, consume a variety of berries, some of which are toxic to us. Even squirrels, which typically eat nuts, safe for humans, sometimes gnaw on mushrooms and nuts that can make us feel very unwell. Just because an animal eats something doesn't mean it's safe for you to munch on. There is a belief that to find water, you should follow flying birds. But this method is super unreliable. While some aquatic birds rarely stray far from water, many species roam extensively in search of food. There are people who believe that geese fly toward water at dusk. But these birds might just be heading to a clearing to rest for the night. A common belief is that if you can dent wood with your thumbnail, it's suitable for starting a friction fire. This myth is quite widespread, but it isn't reliable. Some softer woods that pass the thumbnail test are ineffective, while some denser woods are quite good for friction fires. The success of the thumbnail test is coincidental. It's not a dependable method altogether. So stop destroying your poor nails. Hmm. Another misconception connected with friction fires is that you should use hardwood to get the best flames. While oak and other hardwoods are excellent for general firewood, they are not ideal for friction fires. Hardwood's high ignition temperature and density make it unsuitable for friction fire drills or boards. Instead, you can use non-resinous softwoods like cottonwood, basswood, cedar, and willow which are much better suited for starting friction fires. Meanwhile, in an emergency situation, eating raw meat and seafood can help you survive. Well, that's not entirely true. Indeed, survival shows often depict hosts eating all kinds of raw things. But this isn't the best survival practice. Raw animal meat contains pathogens, including bacteria, viruses, and other microorganisms. They can easily cause serious and hard-to-diagnose illnesses in humans. Many people consume sushi and don't experience any health issues. But that's because certain raw seafood from saltwater is safe because the pathogens it contains are not harmful to humans. To minimize health risks, always make sure that meat and seafood are properly cooked before you eat them. Rubbing two sticks together isn't likely to produce a fire. Of course, friction is a real way to create a flame. But friction fires techniques require patience, practice, and even a bit of luck. It might look easy in movies or TV shows, but don't get overconfident, thinking you'll be able to do it without tons of practice in a stressful situation. If you're still eager to try it out, use a downward speed motion rather than a lot of force. Okay, so let's say you don't have enough patience to start a friction fire, but you do have matches. Well, they got wet at one point, but they're all dry now. Great! Eh, not really. It's a myth that when dried, matches will work as they're supposed to. You see, the chemicals used in matches are vulnerable to humidity and moisture. Regular safety matches have a package with a striking surface that's made of a gritty material. For instance, powdered glass mixed with phosphorus. The head of the match is also made with grit, along with sulfur and an oxidizer. A tiny amount of heat that is created when you strike a match is caused by the friction of the glass powder grinding together. It converts the phosphorus into white phosphorus, and it begins to catch fire. Match heads that were wet at one point simply won't light because of the careful chemical balance inside is all messed up. So, if you're heading somewhere where there's a chance to get wet, either invest in waterproof matches or keep your matches in a waterproof container. Some people believe that a big fire can beat a shelter. In reality, though, even a fire made from large logs can't be an excuse to skip that important step. It can start raining heavily, and the flames will go out in no time. Plus, it's not that cool to sleep in the open. Wild animals aren't going to miss out on a delicious meal, like you. 
So it's always a good investment to take the time to build a shelter that will protect you from the elements and wild animals. There's a myth that all base layers work equally well. Unfortunately, this is not true. For example, cotton might lead to hypothermia if you rely on it as your primary base layer when the weather's cold. This fabric is great for wearing around the house, but it's better to use it in hot, dry climates. Once cotton gets wet, its insulating properties become non-existent. As soon as you start sweating, the moisture will soak into the cotton fibers and your clothes will begin cooling your body through conduction. And keep in mind that cotton fibers can keep up to 27 times their weight in water. And then they'll store that liquid for up to eight times longer than wool or synthetic fabrics. So the rule is, if it's cold enough for a onesie, then it's too cold for cotton. One of the most popular and dangerous survival myths depicted in movies and described in books is that you can suck the venom from a snake bite. In reality, it doesn't work. Even worse, it opens the affected person to a larger risk of infection by creating a bigger wound. And that's a wound with bacteria swarming human spit inside. Ew. Just put a pressure dressing on the wound and try to get medical help as fast as possible. Now, one might think that with a GPS, you'll never get lost. Of course, you should always take a GPS unit with you when you go hiking, if you have one. Keeping a GPS device with you will give you peace of mind, but you should keep in mind that these gadgets aren't fail-safe. You can misplace or break your device, or it can run out of battery. That's why you better have a map and compass, as well as the knowledge how to use them as a backup. After all, navigation isn't only about knowing which way to go. It's also about knowing where you are at the moment. There is a common belief that if you're stuck in a snowy environment without access to drinking water, consuming snow is the best way to rehydrate. However, this is a misconception and can actually lead to further dehydration. Why so? Well, when you eat snow, your body expends energy to melt and warm it up, which causes you to lose liquids faster. Plus, consuming snow can lead to hypothermia, a condition that is especially dangerous if you're alone in the wild. Snow might also contain harmful bacteria that can make you ill. If you have no other choice than to consume snow, melt it first using some sort of heat. Plus, avoid snow that doesn't appear fresh and white. Yeah, avoid that kind. If you experience frostbite, it's crucial to deal with it quickly. It's a dangerous misconception that you need to apply hot water to the affected area. In reality, it can worsen the damage. Instead, if medical help isn't immediately available, remove any wet clothing and submerge the frostbitten area in warm water. Prevent the affected area from refreezing and keep it elevated to minimize swelling. Apply a bandage to the area. If it's your finger or toes, wrap each one separately and place cotton pads in between them. They shouldn't touch. And remember this, never ever rub the frostbitten area. Should you find yourself lost in the wilderness, try to find a stream or small creek and follow it downstream until it joins a larger river. It'll likely lead you to civilization. Do not believe the myth that water is safe to drink if animals drink it. Always purify any water you find to avoid serious health problems. Even clear water can contain dangerous microorganisms. It's also a myth that it's safe to drink small amounts of salt water. This can actually lead to dehydration much more quickly than not drinking water altogether. Use salt water to cool down your body in hot weather, but don't drink it. So, you stumble upon a cave while lost in the wilderness, and it seems like an ideal shelter, especially if you have matches and can find wood nearby. But keep in mind that you should never build a fire inside the cave. The heat can cause the rocks to expand and potentially break, leading to a rock fall or landslide. Instead, 
build your fire outside the cave to stay safe and warm. When you realize you are lost during a hike, stop moving immediately. It may seem counterintuitive, but staying put and creating a shelter increases your chances of rescuers finding you. This approach also prevents you from dehydration caused by continuous movement. Now, you might have heard that if you come across an unfriendly swarm of bees, you should jump into the water and the buzzing creatures will leave you alone. The problem is that bees are patient. They will wait for you to resurface. Instead, run in a straight line as fast as you can until the bees give up the chase. Better yet, find a shelter in a car, house, or a public bathroom. Now, here are a few more survival tips as a bonus. Keep them in mind, and you'll be prepared for any kind of emergency. Upon encountering a snake, do not approach it and don't try to scare it away. Snakes are sensitive to vibrations, so making noise by raising your voice, clapping, or stomping can encourage it to retreat. If possible, simply walk away from the reptile. If you're falling from a cliff, <clears throat> and you can think, try to break your fall into several shorter parts to absorb the impact. Grabbing onto sturdy objects like bushes or rocks can slow your fall and increase your chances of survival. Good luck! If you've fallen through ice into freezing water, do not try to pull yourself out by grabbing the ice edge directly. It'll likely break. Instead, kick your legs to position your body horizontally and then wriggle out onto the ice. Once on the ice, stay spread out to distribute your weight and prevent further breaks. If you spot a whirlpool at sea, stay calm. Understand the direction of its spin, ride along its side, and use its current to propel yourself out of danger. If trapped, take a deep breath and wait for a chance to swim away as the whirlpool weakens. If trapped under debris during an earthquake, protect your respiratory system and conserve your air supply. Use your shirt as a makeshift hood to shield your face from dust and debris while you attempt to reach the surface. When stuck in quicksand, keep your head and arms above the surface. Wiggle your legs slowly to allow the quicksand to fill the space and create more room for movement. Stretch out on your back to increase your surface area and use gentle movements to free yourself. If you're out of kindling for starting a fire, use junk food, for example, chips. They can serve as effective substitutes for dry leaves due to their high fat content. Spaghetti noodles can also be used in a pinch. You're up to your neck in cold water. There's ice all around you. You've got to get out! When you're swimming in freezing cold water, your body can get a bit of a shock. Your reflexes might make you want to gasp, but don't! Just do your best to keep your head above water. Throw off any heavy objects like boots, jackets, or backpacks. When you reach some ice, don't just try and jump out. It's not exactly a swimming pool. Try to get into a horizontal position and use your strong legs to swim onto the ice. Use your hands to pull you out. Once you're on the surface, roll away from the edge, then crawl, then walk. If you're venturing into the wild, you may want to get some stuff ready beforehand. Make your own fire starter at home. Heat up some water in a pan, put a Pyrex container in there, and melt some paraffin wax inside it. Then take an egg carton and put some dryer lint in each section. Fill them with paraffin, wait till it's all solid, and cut out each little section. Just one of these little guys will make starting a fire way easier. Dental floss can be super handy for surviving in the wild. You can use it as fishing line with a can tab as a hook. Or you can use it as a clothesline. Just stretch it between two trees. It looks kind of flimsy, but a single strand can hold up to 5 pounds. It's also quite flammable, so if you're having trouble starting a fire, you can use a few feet of floss to start it up. You can make a seriously strong rope using a simple plastic bottle, if you have a good pair of scissors. Cut off the neck of the bottle so it looks like a tall and narrow cup. 
Then, start cutting it like some people peel an orange, round and round in a spiral. Try to keep it the same thickness the whole time. It'll be a lot longer and stronger than you're expecting. You can use it to tie sticks together to make a hut, or you can wrap it around your backpack in case it rips or something. Sugar might be damaging for your teeth, but it's got a pretty sweet superpower. Just pour some on a piece of cloth and use it like a Band-Aid. Oh, delicious. Mosquitoes can be a real pain, and there are loads of them around. You can make your own DIY repellent to keep those little guys away. All you need is an orange, a lemon, or any other citrus fruit. They're full of essential oils that mosquitoes can't stand. Peel an orange and rub the peel directly on your skin. Just make sure to crumple it a bit beforehand to help those precious essential oils come out. Another good way to keep the mosquitoes at bay is to add a bit of orange peel to your campfire. That releases the essential oils into the air. You're getting hungry, but you don't have anything to start a fire with. Empty your pockets. There might be something in there that you can use as a makeshift fire starter. If you have a battery and a metal chewing gum wrapper, you're in business. Cut a thin strip of the wrapper, long enough to connect the two sides of the battery. The middle of the strip should be thinner than the ends. Grab some dry grass, twigs, or even some paper, whatever you're going to use to start your fire. The foil strip should ignite right away, so make sure you're ready. A human can go surprisingly long without food, but not water. Depends where you are, but a lot of the time, it might not be safe to drink. You can make a DIY water filter. Start with a fire. Boiling the water may not be enough, so as soon as those ashes are cool, grind them into a powder. Don't just use any ash you randomly found in the forest. It might have some melted plastic on it or something. Then, you need a plastic bottle. Cut off the bottom and poke a small hole in the cap. Turn it upside down. Put about three inches of charcoal in, and pour the boiled water in nice and slowly. The drips are ready to drink. If you're getting bits of ash in the water, wrap a piece of clean cloth around the cap for some extra filtration. A char cloth can come in handy if you're lost in the wild. To make it, you're gonna need a metal container with a cover. Put a piece of cloth inside it and put the container into a fire for a few minutes. The cloth should end up getting a bit black around the edges, but still be intact. A char cloth catches fire super fast, even with an old school flint. If you're ever hiking in an anaconda's backyard, listen up. Stay away from shallow rivers because these giant snakes love to hang out there. If an anaconda decides to give you a little squeeze, don't exhale. Every time you do, the snake's gonna squeeze you a little bit tighter. Anacondas do have a weak spot though. They don't like their tail to be bitten. It's not exactly delicious, but it'll get the job done. Avalanches are pretty powerful, so remember these tips next time you're out on the slopes if things get a bit hairy. First off, cover your mouth, use a scarf or some other piece of cloth, and don't let the snow in. Keep one arm straight above your head, and don't forget to dig out a little pocket in front of your face. That'll let you breathe for about a half hour. Get rid of anything heavy you're carrying, even if it's expensive. But make sure you hold onto your backpack. It's an extra layer of protection. And grab onto a tree if you see any. To get back to the surface, move like you're swimming straight up. Snow's just water anyway. If you ever somehow get trapped in a sinking car, don't panic and don't try to open the door. The water pressure from the outside will be too strong. You'll just waste valuable energy, and that door just won't open. The best way to escape is through the windows. Roll them down and swim away. If you're not a great swimmer, you can try to create your own makeshift flotation device, like a plastic bag with air trapped inside. Tie a knot in it and make sure it's tight. A plastic bottle would work great, but one probably won't be enough. You can also use a raincoat or a pair of those waterproof pants. You can even use an upside-down trash can. If you have some car trouble at night, out in the woods for example, you need light to see what you're doing. All you need is a bottle of water or a jug. 
or even a pickle jar filled with water. Just strap it on a headlight, and voila! The water will spread the light so you can see better. Perfect for setting up an emergency tent, or finding wood for a fire. Mason jars, those pickle ones, are really handy when it comes to storing matches. If you're camping in a forest, it's really important to hide those matches away, somewhere dry and safe. To make it even more convenient, make a strikeable lid. Cut off the strips on the side of your matchboxes and glue them to the lid of your mason jar. Before your next big outdoor adventure, make sure you're all stocked up on dark chocolate. Chocolate is probably the most delicious survival food, but it's also one of the best. It's loaded with calories and helps keep your mood up. Plus, you don't need a fork, plate, or fire to prepare it. Last one for today, people. Still having trouble lighting that fire? Look no further than that bag of chips you secretly hid from your fellow campers. Corn-based chips are everywhere these days. And apart from tasting delicious and turning your fingers a weird color, they have one more trick up their sleeve. You can use them to start a fire. These kind of chips are flammable, so make a little mound of chips and keep that dry wood handy. They'll light in seconds. Welcome to an uninhabited island. How did we end up here? Well, I don't know. But now, we have to survive here for a couple of days, and I'll teach you all I know. Gladly, wherever I go, I'm always prepared for a situation like this. So in this magical backpack, I've got everything we're gonna need for survival. The first thing is, of course, a knife, which will come in handy in many situations. Surrounded by the ocean, you don't have any drinking water available. Oops, I didn't put any water in the backpack. But don't panic. Your most reliable source of water here is the coconuts. So we need to fetch some of those. If you're lucky to get some green coconuts, you can cut them open with a knife. It's relatively easy. But the problem is that they grow high up on the tree. You're free to climb up there to get some, but it's not gonna be easy. Luckily, when coconuts mature, they turn brown and fall off the tree. The water inside stays safe to drink for about nine months, so you can pick some up from the ground. The problem here is that they can be pretty hard to open. However, if you're lucky to have a screwdriver, it won't be a big deal. Also, a simple stone can crack a coconut for you, but don't forget to wrap it in a towel or even a t-shirt beforehand. Remember that you can't drink as many coconuts as you want. Don't drink more than five brown coconuts a day, unless you want to get an upset stomach. By the way, the same goes for green coconuts. After you drink a brown coconut, don't rush to throw it out. You can scrape off the white part and eat it. It's totally edible. I admit, I didn't bring any bowls, but this is once again where coconuts come in handy. It can be turned into one. After you cut it open, you have bowl-shaped pieces. Start by removing all the white stuff from the inside until it's just a shell. This is going to be your bowl, but we'll make it pretty. Scrape the hair off using the knife. Then you can rub it around with sand, making it smoother. The last thing to do is to polish it with the coconut's very own coconut meat. The oils in it will make your bowl shiny and pretty. Okay, the most important skill is to make fire, of course. I did put a couple of lighters and a matchbox in the bag to make it easier, but you just can't be a qualified survivor if you don't know how to start a fire without them. You need to find a curved piece of wood and tie a bowstring to it like this, so it looks like a bow. In case you don't have a nylon cord, a shoestring will work too. So whenever you go traveling, wear shoes with laces, I guess. Next, find a piece of dry hardwood. It will be your spindle. You will need to wrap the string of the bow around it so you can create friction. The spindle can be fixed to a board with a notch that can hold it. Also, you'll need to find another piece of wood that's usually called a hand block. It should have a dimple carved into it, which will make it easier for you to create friction. So here's how it goes. The board holds the spindle, and you twist the bowstring around it just like this. On top, you hold the spindle with a hand block. 
Then you start moving the bow, rubbing it around the spindle and creating friction. It will start heating up, and in the end, you'll get an ember. After you get an ember, you need to carefully move it to a bundle of tinder and blow on it, trying to start the fire. It's going to be tough to do it the first time, but after you get a hold of it, you can start the fire in less than five minutes. Now that we have the fire, we need food. The obvious choice is to go fishing. So in my magic backpack, I have a fishing kit. It's just a small box with some hooks and strings, but it's going to be a tremendous help. The rest is just practice and skills. If you manage to catch some, you need to cook it. And that's the easy part now that you have both fish and fire. Wrap your fish in coconut leaves, tie it up with bark, and put it on the coals of your fire. Wait for about 20 minutes, but before eating, make sure it's well cooked. Just pierce the fish at an angle with a fork or a toothpick and twist gently at the thickest point. If the fish is cooked, it will flake easily. Bon appétit! Everything changes when the sun goes down. You have to be prepared for the night. So, during the day, you have to make a shelter out of sticks and palm tree leaves. Pieces of bark can be used as strings, but it's also a good idea to walk along the shore and see what gets washed out. There can be a lot of trash there, and some of that can be useful. If you go to an island, you need to have devices that will help you not to get lost. I have something here. It's a multifunction water resistant watch I got on Amazon. Apart from the time, there's also a compass, a thermometer, a scraper, a whistle, and even a fire starter. Yeah, you don't really need to spend two hours with the sticks, but I wanted to teach you. <laughs> so take the watch with you as you go into the jungle. We need material for the shelter sticks, bark, and palm tree leaves which are actually harder to pull off the tree than you may imagine. So dry ones on the ground work too. Make the roof of the shelter using palm tree leaves, but also put some on the ground for you to lie on. But be careful. Make sure that the leaves you're using are free of snakes, spiders, or scorpions. You don't want any of them in your bed. The other thing is that at night, insects and many other creatures come out and they will be very happy to join you in your shelter. So the fire and termite mounds around the shelter will help to keep at least some of them away. Others can still sneak in and climb under your clothes, walk on you, and bite you. So, time for the magic backpack. Here, I have a survival sleeping bag. Being just four inches long, it doesn't take up much space but it's tear-resistant, waterproof, and keeps your body heat inside. Plus, it has sealed seams, which will keep out water, wind, and any insects. You can find it on Amazon. Also, don't build the fire right in front of the entrance of the shelter. In this case, you might end up breathing smoke all night. And now you're all set. Just a couple of tips on how to survive. Your phone, which is probably the one thing you'll have with you, is pretty useless here. But not exactly. The screen of your no-signal cell can be used to reflect sun and moonlight to send SOS signals. Second, in conditions when you don't particularly have much water resources, try to keep your body cool. So just walk in the water once in a while so it doesn't get overheated and so that you don't get too dehydrated. And, of course, always have a first aid kit with you. It's the last survival thing I have in my backpack. Also, from Amazon. It's a water-resistant bag with a pair of scissors, band-aids, tweezers, bandages, and so on. Pretty useful stuff in the wild. Happy survival, even though I hope you'll never have to do it unprepared. Well, you finally made it. After all that training, you're ready for your first skydive. Full of confidence, you reach the door of the plane as it gets to 12,000 feet. You step off into the air, but at the last second, you hear the instructor screaming something. Sorry, I didn't check your chute. Well, you can't hear him as you drop away from the plane. 
seeing only his concerned expression. Well, feels like something has gone wrong. You pull the handle to release the parachute, but it hasn't deployed correctly, opening into a big wad, and you're now spinning faster and faster. You're getting dizzy, but you need to pull yourself together. Each second is crucial, and from this altitude, you have less than a minute to act. You throw yourself into the Bowman formation, spreading your body out with your arms and legs forming a big X. This creates a little more drag, allowing you to stabilize a bit. Hey, this whole thing is a drag. Now you have more time to get to your emergency reserve chute. Still dizzy from spinning, you try to remember where it is. You grab what you think is the right strap and pull it hard. Oh no, that's a leg strap! You've loosened the container on your back, and now you're slipping out! This is not your lucky day. You hold on and tighten up the leg strap. Oh yeah, the safety procedure is coming back to you now. Hmm, step one, cut away from the main parachute with the red handle. Done! Now you're in free fall again. Step two, now find the silver ripcord handle to pop the reserve chute. Gotta hurry, the ground is rushing up at you. Where's that handle? Whoops, there it is, sitting on your chest on the left. You yank it hard. Ka-thump! The chute flies out and deploys and slams the brake on your descent. Now you're relieved. Breathtaking? Heart pounding? Oh yeah! Finally, you can enjoy the view. For about 10 seconds before you land on the ground. Softly. Feet first. Hey, looks like fun. Sign me up. On another day, as always, instead of taking the stairs, you use the elevator. Now, the odds of it falling are 1 in 10 million. You're 10 times more likely to be hit by lightning. But today, you're in that unlucky elevator. As you move down from the fifth floor, the pulley system fails, a cable snaps, and the elevator starts falling. Quickly, you lie down on your back, placing one arm around your head to protect it from the impact, and the other arm over your face to save it from possible falling objects. You spread your legs out evenly. In just a couple of seconds, you brace for impact. It crashes down, and debris from above falls around you. Fantastic job! You've avoided injury! But could it be possible to alter the impact by jumping? Well, let's think this through. If you jump too early, your impact would be more severe as your speed would increase in the descent. And if you jump too late, the velocity of your jump upwards would cause you to bump your head as the elevator would have stopped. You need to jump at the precise moment to be effective in velocity. And without the ability to see through steel, it would be down to sheer luck. So it's better to use the lie-down method. Yeah, good luck with that. You casually drive to work, passing over the same bridge as any other day. Today, there's more traffic than normal, and you're stuck in a jam. The bridge starts to creak. Unfortunately, it's possible for structurally faulty bridges to collapse under excess weight. And there you are. As the bridge falls into the river, your car floats on top. The water is slowly rising around you as it starts to sink. You're trying to remain calm and take a deep breath. You have up to two minutes before the car completely sinks. You need to act fast and roll down the window. As you take off your seatbelt, you notice the water has risen above the windows. You try to roll them down, but they're stuck in place from the pressure. You've missed your opportunity. You're sinking further down and thinking about opening the door. Hmm, better not. This will make your vehicle sink even faster. Plus, it'll be more dangerous to exit. The car hits bottom, and the water is slowly entering it. You try to open the door, but the pressure is so intense that it won't budge. You think about the water coming in. Maybe if you waited until there's enough water inside, it could regulate the pressure, allowing the doors to open. But with the limited air that would remain, and if the doors still don't work, that's too much of a risk. Your only choice is to smash the window. You can do it easily due to the water pressure, and it spills in quickly. You take your last deep breath while holding on to the window frame. The car fills in quickly, and the suction suddenly stops. You pull yourself through the window and place your feet on the car, push upwards, and swim to the surface. Yeah, remind me not to carpool with you. Next, you're out hiking in a forest and find the perfect place to view the sunset. You take a photo, and it looks great! But wait, which way is it back to camp? It's getting dark, and you have no idea how you got here. You check your phone. It has a map, so you'll be fine, right? Well, you've taken way too many nature pics, and the battery has run out. 
You can survive up to three hours without shelter in harsh weather. You can go without water for three days, and up to three weeks without food. You need to address your next actions in order of importance. So your first task is to build a shelter. You lean a large stick onto a tree for the roof support. Then you build two walls on the sides, making a sturdy frame. There are plenty of leaves in the forest, and you cover the roof with heaps of them for insulation and protection. On the inside, you build a nice leafy mattress. You enter and wait until morning, hoping to have a relaxing sleep. Well, you've slept horribly, but there's no time to leave a review on your booking app. The next task is finding water. You follow a clear decline in the land, eventually finding a stream. Clean water? Check. You continue to walk with the stream's flow, hoping it leads you to a river. You are more likely to find people and signs of civilization along large collections of water. Hours pass, and your belly grumbles. You look around for tasty snacks. There are berries and mushrooms, but you don't recognize them. So it's better not to eat something if you're unsure whether it's poisonous. You search under old logs and branches for bugs. You've found some mealworms that can be eaten raw. Some insects, when cooked, can be a major source of iron, protein, and vitamin B12. You look at them, and your appetite goes away. Hmm, maybe later. Finally, the stream connects to a river, and just ahead of that, a bridge. Not the one that fell down. Well, the struggle is over. You throw the bugs away and begin the next adventure, finding a diner. Yeah, we're not going camping together either. Next, you're walking in a field. The wind is picking up, and not far away, a tornado is forming. You start running away from it, but you can't outrun it as it travels up to 60 miles per hour. Your main concern isn't the tornado itself, but the trees and buildings that the twister takes in, turning them into dangerous flying objects. They fly at crazy speeds as they're carried by fast winds, reaching up to 300 miles per hour. You look for shelter, but there's nothing available. Your only possibility is a ditch that's not surrounded by trees or other breakable objects. You lie wedged in a ditch and cover your head with your jacket, holding it down with your arms for protection. While lying flat, with that thundering noise around you, you feel like you're in a giant jet engine. It's a terrifying sound. But luckily, you're not in the tornado's pathway. You can hear the small debris whistling over your head, and many make an impact, thudding all around you. But thankfully, they miss. Suddenly, everything goes calm. You lie there controlling your breathing, trying to relax. You don't get up, not yet, as the worst may be yet to come. Tornadoes can last from several seconds to up to an hour. You're not taking your chances and remain in your ditch for the full hour. But finally, when it's clear that it's gone, you dust off your jacket and head home. Meanwhile, you're really bad luck, so I'm removing you from my contacts and unfriending you on social media. And I'll do that once I get out of the hospital. Welcome back to Science and You. As you're walking in the wild, a snake appears from some dry bushes and bites you above your ankle. How rather unfortunate. Keep calm. You must keep your heart rate and blood pressure low to slow down the spread of the venom. Remove your shoes and socks. Now you must find out whether the bite came from a venomous or non-venomous snake. If you see two deep puncture wounds on your leg, they came from the venomous fellow's fangs. In a non-venomous serpent's bite, you'll see small sharp teeth in a U-shape. There are around 600 venomous snake species, and you should look out for vipers and cobras. Each has a different type of venom and needs different treatments. If a viper bites you, don't put pressure on your wound. Trapping the venom in one area could make the tissue damage worse. Then you must rush to the nearest hospital for treatment. If a cobra bites someone, you must tie the area with a bandage to stop the venom from going further into their system. Keep an eye on the fellow that was bitten to make sure they're breathing. Yes, cobra venom can paralyze the diaphragm. Don't suck out the venom. It travels so fast into someone's system, you'll achieve nothing. Take a good look at the snake, and if you can, snap a few photos of it to show the medical staff. Try to have good picture composition. Moving on from snakes to allergies. Most people respond to allergens with a runny nose or some sneezing, but others have far more complicated responses. 
An itchy rash may be a sign of an allergic reaction. It might look like dermatitis, and it can show up a week after your exposure to an allergen. There was a rare case a few years ago. Someone got braces for the first time, and after a week, they developed an itchy rash under their wristwatch and stomach. As it turned out, they were allergic to the nickel in braces. If you get blisters on your skin after sitting in the sun for one to two hours, it's probably not sunburn, but an allergic reaction. You may also have some skin redness, tiny raised bumps, and scaling. When that happens, go to the emergency room fast. Experts will run tests and give you advice on how to continue from there. Sometimes different medications might cause it too, or fruits such as limes and parsnips can. If you're allergic to pollen, stay away from fruits and veggies. Some of them have proteins like the ones found in pollen, and your immune system responds to it as real pollen. They can trigger the same allergy symptoms such as itchiness, swelling of the mouth, face, and, well, you know the gist. You're trapped in a car during a winter storm. Outside, it's freezing, and you begin to shiver. That's a good thing. When temperatures drop below a comfortable level, your body starts to shake. This action boosts your body's surface heat production by 500%. But shivering can only warm you up for so long. After a while, your muscles will run out of fuel and they'll stop contracting. If someone suddenly stops shaking and they grow tired and want to fall asleep, act fast. Bring them indoors, remove any wet clothes, rub their hands and feet, wrap them in blankets, and find warm, dry compresses to apply to their chest, neck, or lower tummy. Never put a warm compress on their arms or legs. The sudden heat will force cold blood back to the heart, brains, and lungs, causing the body's core temperature to drop. While you're driving down an empty road, you hear an emergency radio broadcast about the weather. A tornado watch in your area means that a tornado is likely to happen. But a tornado warning means a tornado has appeared on the radar or has been spotted in person. You should also be on the lookout for hail. It appears when updrafts within a thunderstorm push the rain into the thick clouds and it freezes. But when a tornado is approaching, hail can arrive without rain. Then everything gets quiet. The air becomes still and there's no wind. Suddenly, you'll see the clouds moving quickly in a rotating pattern or toward the sky. You'll hear a loud waterfall sound that will turn into a roar as the tornado gets close. It'll be similar to the sound of trains and jets. Debris will begin to fall, and a funnel-shaped cloud will start to rotate, pulling branches and leaves upwards. If the tornado is not moving to either the left or the right, it might be coming toward you, and you won't realize it until it's too close. Take shelter! Just as you're chilling at home watching TV, you hear an eerie whooshing noise. It sounds like a soft gush of wind, but you confirm there's nothing there after checking all the doors. The next day, you feel pressure in your chest, and it gets worse as the week progresses. The chest pains follow with a dreaded feeling of exhaustion. You can't help but think there's something wrong with your body. But the problems are within your house. You might have carbon monoxide poisoning. When this gas fills your home, it builds up in your bloodstream and it replaces the oxygen in your body. Poisoning can also cause headaches, nausea, and confusion. In those cases, run outside to get fresh air and call emergency service. Also, get a carbon monoxide detector and add it in the hallway or areas where you sleep. Check the batteries twice a year, and when the alarm goes off, step outside and you know who to call. You go ice skating. The ice on the lake seems thicker than it was, and uh-oh, you hear a cracking snap, and you end up in the icy water. First, your body will go into shock because of the sudden change in temperature. Don't worry, it will pass after one to three minutes. 
Now, you must find a solid piece of ice and hold on to it. Don't try to climb it. Just put your arms on it, kick your legs, and push the piece forward. It will help you drag your body onto the ice. Once you're on an ice sheet, don't stand up. If you do, your body weight will concentrate on the smaller ice area and it'll break again. Just keep rolling until you're further on the stable ground. What if you have to break the window of a hot car? Car windows have layers of materials that can resist force. Here's what you need to do. Avoid the back windows or the front windshield of the car. They're harder to break. Go for the passenger and driver's side windows. If you've got a hammer, don't hit the glass in the middle. Aim for the edges, where the glass breaks easily. Now, if the windows refuse to break with a hammer, screwdriver, or whatever you've got around, look for a small, pointy rock. If that doesn't work either, then your best bet is your car's spark plug. Pop your hood, pull out the spark plug, break the porcelain casing, and throw the broken ceramic piece anywhere at the window. It's the middle of summer, and you're vacationing somewhere on the Pacific Rim. Suddenly, you feel a strong quake. Well, this could be the first warning sign of an approaching tsunami. Or it could trigger large waves thousands of miles across. But there are other telltale signs that a tsunami is approaching. One is a change in water levels, either rising or falling. If you see the ocean withdrawing quickly and the seabed getting exposed, you should run at least 100 feet above sea level and one mile inland. Many experts say once the seawater starts receding, you've got five minutes to evacuate before the enormous wave hits. Remember, it's all about science and you. You're flying over the Pacific Ocean when suddenly a storm hits the plane, causing it to shake. The aircraft begins to descend and you lose control. You quickly put on a parachute, eject yourself from the plane and land on an island. It's a good thing you were the only one on the plane transporting some goods overseas. Luckily enough, the storm hasn't damaged your parachute. You unstrap yourself and head to the closest shelter under some palm trees. You're waiting for the storm to be over. The next day. The sun is shining and the waves seem nice and friendly. You wake up and look around. Nothing but a large stretch of water encircling you from all directions. Not a boat, human or another living being is around. You scout the island, trying to find anything. You don't even know what you're looking for. On one side of the small island, you see some scrap metal and remnants of the plane washed ashore. You rush over there and try to see if there's anything useful. Too bad everything is destroyed. However, one sealed box has made it. You open it and see dozens of duct tape rolls piled on top of each other. After going through the island, you head back to your camp, dragging the box of duct tape. You try to figure out what to do. Soon, you get a light bulb moment. There are some places on the island that are hard to access, and since your shoes have been damaged, you fashion out some sandals. To do it, you grab some branches and try to use duct tape to make a new pair of shoes. After many failed attempts, you almost give up. But then, you attach some duct tape to pieces of tree bark that are roughly the size of your foot. Those are going to be the soles of your new shoes. The duct tape is smooth and won't hurt your feet. After adding several branches, you wrap the duct tape around your feet and voila! You have duct tape sandals. Now you can venture into the rocky parts of the island without damaging your feet. As you walk along the island, you start feeling the heat. You wrap your shirt around your head, but it's not enough to protect you. You use some duct tape to create a hat with the help of leaves. Then you place it on your head. You're now safe to go. After a while, you bring back some stuff you found around the island. By this time, you've started to feel that your tummy is rumbling. 
Next, at a rocky reef, you spot some large yummy crabs and fish, but you can't catch them with your bare hands. You grab a long branch, take some palm tree leaves, and tie everything together to make a net. You then use the duct tape to reinforce it and head to the reef. You're wearing your makeshift sandals and the hat to protect your head and carrying the net to catch some fish. So far, you've only used two rolls of duct tape. After a while, you manage to catch some fish and crabs and take them back to the camp. You make a fire and start grilling your catch. You're sitting on a log, but such a seat isn't too comfortable. You take some duct tape and make a mat for yourself. Once the food is ready, you feast on it. Now another problem, water. There's no fresh water around, but a storm is coming. Meanwhile, you take some coconuts and eat dessert while drinking coconut milk to freshen up. You prepare a small hut by gathering branches and leaves and duct taping them together so that water can't seep into your new home. At the same time, you create a funnel out of duct tape to collect rainwater. After getting into the funnel, the water is collected in a makeshift pond, also made out of duct tape. At this point, you've used almost half of the duct tape rolls. The storm starts brewing, and you stay inside your hut, where you have your new floor mat. You're bored, so you create a chair and table out of duct tape to make the hut a little comfier. It starts raining, and you notice that some water has gathered in the reservoir you built. You immediately drink it, using a coconut shell as a glass. Your hut manages to withstand the storm, and you catch some Zs on your comfy mat. The next day, you check the duct tape supply and see that you are now halfway to finishing your last roll of tape. You've made a secured and solid hut and have a steady food supply from the reef. You've already spent five days on the island, so now it's time to find a way out. You've tried your best to seek help, but nothing. Not a plane or ship in sight. You're desperate to get out, and you're lucky. You spot a cargo ship very far off in the distance. You need to act quickly. After reviewing your box of duct tape, you decide to create a raft to sail away. You gather enough food and water for the journey and get to work. You start by collecting large logs for a base and setting them side by side. You have some rope made from tree bark and leaves to tie the logs together. It's big enough to fit you. You then get another set of logs and place them on top of the base and repeat the same process to create a second layer. This way, you minimize the risk of sinking. In the end, you duct tape all weak spots to reinforce your raft. You use some branches to create oars for rowing with paddles made out of duct tape. You see that you've used around 75% of your supply, including the tape you use to construct the hut and furniture. It's not as strong as fresh duct tape, but it still does the job. After the base and oars are finished, you create a small hut to shelter your food and supplies and protect them from waves. Also, you make a mast out of wood and use a piece of cloth as a sail. You put the raft on the water and begin rowing. So far so good. You open the sail and take a break from rowing. You turn around and take a look at the island that has been your home for the past five days. You're going on a dangerous journey, risking it all. But if you remain on the island for too long, then you definitely won't make it. It's been an hour already, and the island is barely visible. But the ship is getting closer. You still have one more roll of duct tape to use in emergency situations. The waters are calm, and you see dolphins swimming around. You snack on some fish and drink some water before noticing that the waves have gotten larger. You prepare your sail and duck for cover. It's a good thing your raft is sturdy. Large waves crash against it, knocking off some of your food and water. But the raft is still in one piece. As time passes, 
The sun begins to set, and there's still no sign of life. You use the rest of the duct tape to repair the raft. Even though you lost some food during the storm, you have your net to catch more fish. You start a small and safe bonfire in a coconut shell, cook the fish, and start eating. You turn around and spot a ship coming your way. You immediately grab a branch, light it, and start waving it for the ship to see you. It looks like it will miss you. But then, someone on the ship notices you. They drop down an emergency boat to pick you up and rescue you. It's safe to say that duct tape has truly saved your life. You're driving around with your friend Annie in the wild Australian outback. The sun is scorching hot, but you see a mob of cute kangaroos hopping around. You stop the car and you get out to film them with your friends. You even go live to impress your friends and followers. Suddenly, one of the kangaroos leaps towards you at full velocity, ready to swing. Alright, let's freeze right here for a second before you or your friend get hurt. Kangaroos have extremely powerful legs and can jump around 30 feet in the air. Those strong legs can let them hop at speeds of up to 30 miles per hour, faster than any average human. So if you're thinking about running a mob of angry kangaroos or a single kangaroo, then don't. They'll chase after you and knock you down before you even reach your top speed. Their tails are strong and sometimes act like a fifth limb when they're grazing in a field. Kangaroos generally eat grass like cows, but also feast on shrubs, moss, and even fungi. Their tails are essential for keeping balance. They can stand as tall as six feet, with their tail making up half of that. Back to you guys. The kangaroo is only a few feet away from you. The first thing you have to do is protect your body. Turn it sideways and extend your arm out. Make sure your head is out of reach. Their paws have very sharp claws, so you don't want them laying any jabs on you, especially your head. They kick with both feet, which means they rest their body on their tails and extend both legs to push kick their aggressors, aka Annie and you. Their feet are huge, which makes them even more dangerous. Well, time is still frozen, so you and Annie get into position and are ready for the kangaroo attack. And action! The kangaroo stands face to face with you like a boxer in a ring. It moves closer, but you're in the correct position to reduce damage from your end as much as you can. Even though you know how to defend yourself, facing off with a six-foot kangaroo isn't the best idea. The best you can do is slowly back away without startling it. Don't turn your back on it, you might get a surprise attack. If backing up doesn't help, let it know it's won this battle. Don't return any eye contact if you can. Cower yourself. You might have missed some warning signs while observing them from afar. The kangaroos weren't stomping their feet because they were excited to see you. They were telling you not to come any closer. When one of them hopped over to you, it stood high on its legs and flexed its muscles to show dominance. The biggest fail of all is that you pulled over while they were grazing peacefully. They thought of you as a threat and went into defensive mode. The mob has several joeys, or baby kangaroos, sticking their heads out of their mother's pouches. Female kangaroos have a pouch on their belly made of a fold of skin to house the babies. When they're first born, they're only the size of a grape, but then blossom to the giants that they are. Only after 10 months, joeys are old enough to move out of mom's pouch and hop on their own. So, you and Annie survived that confrontation for now. But what happens when you're face to face with a 40-foot kangaroo? I'm just kidding, we're keeping it real here. It would be super difficult to face off with a grizzly bear. The first thing you would need to know about grizzlies is that they're very cute when they're berry picking or just scratching their backs on tree bark. But their dark side is scarier than a kangaroo's. You're having a little picnic with Annie when suddenly a grizzly bear approaches after smelling some yummy food. Don't panic, we'll freeze time here to give you a chance to think about what to do. In general, the best way to survive a grizzly attack is to avoid it altogether. Grizzlies are wanderers always looking for the best spots to find some food. Their sense of smell is impeccable, so its nose led the bear right to your picnic. The bear is very close to you. No need to panic. You should show the bear that you're just a visitor on its territory. Back away slowly while speaking in a low and calm tone. It needs to know that you're submitting to it, as it's the dominant creature in this encounter. There's a lot of tension when you're face to face with a bear, so don't turn your back and make a break for it. 
That will only let the bear chase you down, and you won't win in that race. They're faster than humans and can swim and climb trees, so unless you sprout some wings and fly away, do not try to outrun a grizzly bear. Next, you should avoid eye contact. Just like the cute and cuddly kangaroos, bears take it very seriously and watch your every move. They also consider direct eye contact as a sign of aggression, as if you want to challenge them. Grizzlies also like to play a game of chicken. They wait to see your moves and can even fake a charge to see how you're going to react. Either way, you have to stand your ground. If the bear lowers its head and protrudes its neck towards you, then it knows that it wants to charge right at you. Since we froze time for now, we can't know for sure what its next move is going to be. Let's jump back into action to see what it'll do. Because you'll have to plan your next move depending on the bear's move. And action! The grizzly bear isn't showing any signs of aggression so far. It's just curious about the setting. Remember your training. No eye contact. Okay, the bear is showing some signs of aggression now, which means it could potentially attack you. Stand your ground. It's getting closer. The best thing to do in this scenario is to completely submit to it by laying face down on the ground covering your head with your arms. Don't move. The bear might understand that you're submitting to it and walk away. Sometimes bears will stick around for a while before leaving you alone. Luckily, this bear only wanted the food from the picnic, so it grabs the sandwiches and runs away. You guys were lucky this time, but if the bear did attack you, you'd have to fight it off as much as you can. You can use any objects nearby to help you. It's best to aim for the most sensitive spots, like the bear's eyes and nose, with all your strength. What makes cougars stand out from other predators is that they're excellent stalkers. You're hiking in the forest, and you don't realize that you have an unwelcomed guest along with you. Cougars will stalk you if they think you're good to eat and can pounce from out of nowhere and if it knows it's the right time. These giant cats generally don't attack people, but who knows what's on their mind. The rule of thumb when face to face with a cougar is pretty much the same as with other animals. Stand your ground and don't run. Running will only trigger the cat, as it will outrun you for sure. These cats are strong and have very quick reflexes. Their claws are powerful and their bites are even worse. You don't want to be chased by one of these. Now that you're standing your ground, make yourself appear bigger than the cougar. That's right, raise your arms and puff out your chest. Always keep eye contact to try to assert dominance. You don't have to appear weaker or submissive to the cat, unlike when facing a grizzly or a kangaroo. On the contrary, you need to show that you're more powerful than it is. So don't cower down or break a sweat. It's watching your every move. The next steps really depend on the cougar. Let's resume, shall we? Okay, it's showing signs of aggressive behavior. It's a tough kitty, and it doesn't want to lose this game. If appearing tall doesn't do anything, then try waving your arms around and shout from the top of your lungs. If you can throw some rocks at it to scare it off, then it would be another plus for you. The kitty looks like it wants to attack. No matter what, stand your ground. After a while, the cougar submits and runs away. You won this encounter. Now just because you got away with this doesn't mean you're good in the future. If the cougar did attack you, then your only option would be to fight back. Find some objects nearby to help you, and don't give up. You're hiking the Point Reyes National Seashore, and you bump into a mountain lion. Stay calm. You need to show it that you're not scared. Shout loudly at the lion. Wave your arms. If that doesn't work, start throwing rocks, branches, or anything else you can get your hands on. Aim at the ground in front of the lion. Never throw anything directly at it. That will only make it angrier. If the lion is getting closer, protect your most vulnerable spots. It will aim for the neck and try to grab your arms. So tilt your head forward and protect your neck. And don't make sweeping arm movements. When the lion realizes that you're not an easy opponent, it will probably back off and run away. You're in Yellowstone. Here you have to come face to face with the grizzly bear. It's drinking water from a creek. A safe distance is 200 feet. The grizzly has spotted you. It stands on its hind legs and looks in your direction. Now it's about the height of an average basketball player and it weighs almost 800 pounds. So you don't stand a chance to win. You have to freeze in place. Grizzlies have poor eyesight, so it just might not see you. But then it starts walking in your direction. 
Don't turn your back to it and don't even try to run as fast as you can. It will chase you. You need to seem bigger than you really are. Wave your arms and spread your legs a little wider. Always talk and shout at the bear. It will understand that you're not a humble deer. Try to make a clanking sound of metal. If you have food with you, don't throw it at the bear. Just put it on the ground and keep backing away while facing the bear. If it starts running towards you, your only chance is to fall to the ground and freeze. Bears aren't scavengers, so if it thinks you're not alive, it'll just sniff you, shrug, and walk away. Now you go diving on the Florida coast. You have to protect yourself from the great white shark. Never wear shiny and blinging jewelry when swimming. It attracts sharks. And never swim at night. This is when they go out looking for food. Lots of splashing water can also attract this marine predator. But if the shark swims towards you anyway, the rule here is one, do everything in your power to defeat it. Try to stay calm and swim to the shore. If the shark chooses you as food, there's only one thing that can scare it off. Try to punch the shark in the nose, eyes, or gills. Now you're in Africa. Here in the tall grass of the savanna, you see a lion, and worse, it sees you. The first thing you need to do is maintain eye contact. Don't turn your back to the lion and don't run. This eight-foot predator, weighing like three adults, is running at you at the speed of a car on the highway. But then it stops abruptly and continues to stare at you. Lions often make fake charges to frighten their opponent. At this point, you have to appear much bigger than you really are. Spread your arms and make loud noises. Then the lion can make another fake charge. And if you keep standing still, the lion will realize you're a strong opponent and go the other way. The female lion is way more dangerous than the male one. If it's guarding the babies, it won't stop and you won't stand a chance. Your safari jeep takes you to the next location. You see elephants peacefully drinking water. These guys can be 10 feet tall and weigh as much as two SUVs. They can even flip cars over with their powerful tusks. And now, one of them sees you and wags its big ears. It's bluffing. With those ears, the elephant wants to appear bigger and scare you away. It's also scared and won't run at you all the way. You must let the elephant know you're not threatening it. Don't yell or wave your arms. Take slow steps back until you leave the elephant's personal space. If it runs at you with ears to its head, it's not bluffing. Climbing a tree isn't a good option right now. It might ram the tree and you'll fall down. It might even tilt the tree with its strong trunk. You need to run in a zigzag pattern. The elephant is heavy and it's hard for it to change directions quickly. So gradually, you'll start to pull away from it. But still remember that an elephant can run 25 miles per hour, so you'll unlikely escape from it. Now let's move on to the Nile River. It has the largest number of crocodiles in the world. If you are camping, take a distance of at least 160 feet from the shore. This way, the crocodile will not stumble upon your camp at night. Never take your eyes off the crocodile. It can take advantage of that moment and take you by surprise. Their top speed is only 10 miles per hour, but they can make charges at 40 feet per second from the water. So the only chance to survive is to stay out of the water. If not, the crocodile's weak points are the eyes, the tip of the nose, and the membrane in the throat. This membrane prevents water from entering the crocodile's throat. When running away from a crocodile, be careful not to bump into a hippopotamus. This is one of the most dangerous animals in the world. They can be the size of a business class car and weigh as much as a big elephant. And they can run as fast as horses. So they're sure to outrun you in a sprint. The main thing is to not frighten it. If you're standing far away, get its attention with a loud sound. Usually they will try to get away from you. Use this moment to back away too. But if you see a hippo yawning, it's a sign that you're violating its comfort zone. They can open their mouth at 180 degrees and have the bite force of a crocodile. So you can't beat it and have to run. The best option is to climb a tree or some kind of slope. Hippos have a hard time climbing high places. And if you manage to escape, you'd be one of the few people who survived a face-to-face -face encounter with a hippo. There's also buffaloes living here in the savannah. They can be as tall as an adult and weigh a whole ton. And unlike lions and elephants, they don't make a fake charge. If you see this machine running at you, it definitely has evil intentions. Their powerful horns and skull can bend sheets of metal. They can turn a new car into a pile of scrap metal. You can never outrun a buffalo, so your only option is to find the nearest tree and run to it before the buffalo even starts its charge. If you run into a snake, you need to freeze in place. There are endless species of snakes, and you don't know if your opponent is venomous or not. So you definitely need to avoid getting bitten. Make smooth and slow backward movements. If the snake is following you, stop and start stomping your feet. The strong vibrations of the ground should scare it away. If the snake bit you anyway, try to remember exactly what it looked like. Better yet, take a picture of it. To neutralize the venom, you need to take an antidote to the specific venom of that species of snake. 
you're on your way to Northeast Asia. As you're going through the dense jungle, you see a clearing. Several wild boars are peacefully grazing there. One of them is a female with several children. It'll do anything to protect them, so it's especially aggressive now. Oops, it spotted you. Get ready to defend yourself. If the wild boar is making high-pitched, piercing cries, it's going to strike you. The first thing you need to do is to stay calm and stand still. You have a good chance that the boar will go on its way, but you see it starting to run. And now you have several options. A, you can run away. B, you can face the blow. And C, climb the nearest tree. The first option is wrong. Wild boars can run almost as fast as Usain Bolt. And when it catches up to you, its sharp tusks won't leave you a chance. Option B, stay where you are. Wrong. A wild boar can weigh as much as a motorcycle and be almost as long as an adult. A hit at 25 miles per hour will just knock you down. So the correct option is to climb the nearest tree. If there's no trees, then climb a car or a tall rock. You have to be in a higher position than the boar. When it realizes it can't reach you, it'll leave you alone. The most important thing is to stay away from wild boars. Never try to feed them or provoke them. This black ominous looking snake won't hurt you. It's got no fangs. You may have mistakenly thought that this black critter is none other than a black mamba, but it's just a harmless rat snake. There's one main sign that can help you figure out if a snake is really dangerous. Unfanged species do not have a venom delivery system. Therefore, their bites won't harm you that much. But if you see a snake with fangs, you're in real danger. If you come across a snake, it's best to leave the area and seek assistance from a wildlife professional in identifying the reptile. Here are some tips to help you distinguish between the two types. Observe their behavior, nesting habits, and habitats. Some snakes may shake their tails as a warning signal. Also, venomous snakes typically have triangular-shaped heads, compared to non-venomous snakes with rounded heads. Time for an optical illusion. Can you spot a snake here? You'd better be attentive because there's a boom slang hiding on that tree. This slithery critter has mastered the art of disguise and it likes to pretend to be a tree branch. Also, boom slangs may not have the best sense of smell, but they make up for it with their ability to detect chemicals in the air. Using their tongues, they gather odor molecules and press them against their sensory organs in the mouth. This snake is venomous. Just look at those fangs. Still, while they're not in use, the snake can neatly fold back its fangs into its mouth. Rattlesnakes and humans have something in common. Both have a lot of keratin-made accessories in our bodies. Human nails and hair are made of keratin, and rattlesnakes' rattles are made of it too. The staple sounds these slithery creatures make are similar to the noise we humans can make when we rub our nails against one another. But these reptiles do it super fast, so it almost sounds like hissing. Whenever the snakes shed, they add up a new segment to their rattle. But it's not like the older a snake is, the more segments it has. Their rattles may wear off or break, just like our nails. Rattlesnakes, as well as many other snakes, have a unique inner ear structure that doesn't include an eardrum. This means they can't pick up airborne sounds like we do. Instead, their inner ear is connected to their jaw, and they use this mechanism to feel vibrations. Biologists are still figuring out whether snakes detect sounds through pressure or mechanical vibrations in their bodies. They're also quite selective eaters. Rattlesnakes only chow down when they're feeling hungry, with adults usually waiting around two weeks between meals. These sneaky hunters usually go after mice, rats, squirrels, and rabbits, but they won't say no to a bird if they manage to catch one. Younger rattlesnakes, on the other hand, tend to have a heartier appetite, sometimes dining as often as once a week. Now look at their huge fangs. They're like hypodermic needles, hollow and sharp allowing them to inject venom. What's really cool is that these fangs are hinged and lie flat against the snake's upper jaw when its mouth is closed, only to spring forward perpendicularly when it strikes. Majestic cottonmouths are named this way because of the striking white coloration inside their mouths that they display when threatened. These semi-aquatic serpents effortlessly navigate both water and land earning them the moniker Water Moccasin. 
equipped with heat-sensing facial pits nestled between their eyes and nostrils, they possess an extraordinary ability to detect even the slightest temperature variations, honing in on potential prey with precision. Rarely do cottonmouths bite humans, reserving their venomous strike for moments of provocation. Here's a tip on how to distinguish between non-venomous water snakes and their venomous counterparts, cottonmouths. While water snakes boast a slender build, cottonmouths exude a robust and weighty presence. The telltale signs continue with water snakes sporting elongated, slender tails and heads proportionate to their necks, contrasting with the blocky and broad head of a cottonmouth. The pupils of the water snake are round, a departure from the vertical, cat-like pupils of cottonmouths. Plus, non-venomous snakes don't have the distinctive facial pits characteristic of pit vipers, like cottonmouths. Here's another venomous star the copperhead snake. Their musk smells just like cucumbers. Their venom is pretty particular too. Will you be in trouble if this snake bites you? Totally. Does it help cure lethal conditions? Um, sorta. It's not a 100% proven fact so far, but scientists have been testing this theory for quite a while, and they did notice that the copperhead snake's venom can, if not cure some serious conditions, but slow down their progression. Even so, they have the most venomous bites among all the U.S. snakes, but antivenom for the bites somehow is not always needed. Coral snakes are known for their non-aggressive nature, as they are shy and secretive creatures. Theirs make up less than 1% of snake bites in America. Their venom is a neurotoxin that paralyzes nerves, and due to their small teeth, they must chew on their prey to inject the venom. When feeling threatened, a coral snake will curl the tip of its tail to confuse the attacker about the location of its head. The mysterious and mesmerizing black mamba, also known as the black mouth mamba, calls the rocky savanna its home and loves to hang out near termite mounds. With a color range from gray to dark brown, its name comes from the dark interior of its mouth. Black mambas hold the title of some of the fastest moving snakes globally reaching speeds of 10 to 12 miles per hour on a sleek surface. Despite its fierce reputation, unprovoked attacks on humans remain unproven, and the snake is actually responsible for only a small number of lethal cases each year. Saw-scaled vipers possess a fascinating ability to produce a spine-chilling noise, accompanied by a striking threat display. The unique shape of their scales allows them to create a prolonged rattling hiss or sizzle when they move in a particular terrifying manner. These sounds serve as a clear warning to anyone in close proximity to the snake. Despite being responsible for many fatalities, without treatment, the saw-scaled viper's bites are fatal in fewer than 10% of cases. This contrasts starkly with the king cobra and black mamba, whose untreated bite fatalities are significantly higher. Saw-scaled vipers are known for their extreme aggression and lightning-fast strikes, making them some of the quickest and most unpredictable snakes in the world. When you're out hiking in the bush, remember not to mess with any snakes you come across, even if they don't seem alive. Some sneaky snakes play possum and can strike if bothered. If you spot one, give it some space. When it comes to snakes, they're usually pretty shy and won't bother you unless they feel threatened. Trying to catch or harm a snake is a big no-no, as that's when most snake bites occur. And don't be tricked by their size. Even little snakes can pack a punch. For example, baby brown snakes are born with venom, so it's best to admire them from a safe distance. Each year, over 7,000 Americans fall victim to snake bites, often due to misguided attempts to handle or fight a snake. It's crucial to avoid such actions and seek immediately medical help if bitten. Understanding how to differentiate between venomous and non-venomous snakes is key to assessing potential risks. Contact a professional if you're unsure about a snake's identity and never handle a snake, even if it appears harmless. Leopard seals look so cute, don't they? You wouldn't expect a creature with such lovely eyes to harm you, especially since, on TV, seals were always represented as playful animals who like to goof around with humans. 
but leopard seals are apex predators you shouldn't trust that much. After all, they got the name after a black spotted coat, similar to the one a big cat has. That means they're at the top of the food chain, with rarely any other animal ready to oppose them. It's not that common, but there are known cases where they attacked humans. They're generally more aggressive than other seals. And they're not animals that play well with others. Generally, they prefer to spend time by themselves. The ends of their mouths are permanently curled upward, which looks like they always smile. Since they're solitary animals, finding a partner is harder, so they vocalize to attract it. They even sometimes sing underwater. Dingoes. When you see one, you might think you're looking at an average street dog. But be careful. Dingoes are more closely related to wolves than dogs. They're the biggest land predator in Australia and apex predators. They go after their prey in packs. When they get together, they can confront even bigger animals like the red kangaroo. They generally avoid humans, but when in significant numbers, you should avoid them. Who doesn't love pandas? Because they look so adorable and innocent, they've become a symbol of kindness and peace. Also, they're very lazy since they spend most of their time resting and eating bamboo. Sounds peaceful, but you better not mess with them. If you accidentally cross a panda's territory or the animal senses you're a danger, it can hurt you. They have strong jaws and claws, and in most cases, they're way stronger than humans. They rarely attack humans, but you're safer knowing that pandas are one of those animals you should leave to enjoy their own peace. Slow Loris These animals are so slow that even when something dangerous is approaching, they just stop moving. And don't let their big wide eyes and tiny nose get you. This creature may be adorable, but its bite is venomous and can get you into a lot of trouble. Scientists say slow loris tends to mimic a cobra. It's one of the few venomous mammals in the animal kingdom. And they don't secrete the venom in their mouth like a majority of other animals. Their secret lies in a sweat gland on their arms. So when you think about it, it's not a cute teddy bear, but more like a real little monster. The same goes with koalas. They look so calm, but they'll also attack you if they see you as a threat. It's not that they're typically dangerous animals. They spend most of their time high in eucalyptus trees since they sleep 22 hours a day. And if you came across a koala in the wild, the animal would probably just climb higher so it could avoid you. But if it felt threatened, it would most likely use its teeth and claws as a defense. A swan does not only look delicate and graceful, but romantic too. Many associate swans with true love, but in their case, love hurts because these animals could really harm you. If they see you as a potential danger, they'll do whatever it takes to protect themselves and especially their young. First, they will start hissing like a cat and then flap their giant wings. You should already be running at this point because they can use their strong beaks to pull, bite, and hit with their powerful wings. Platypus. This one looks a bit like a mythical creature and a combination of different animals. Take a look at its webbed feet and the snout. Definitely a duck, right? It has the fur of an otter and a paddle tail like a beaver. And they look so graceful when you see them swimming underwater using their webbed front feet. But they're not so elegant while walking on land. You see their nails come out so they can walk better. Also, the males are venomous. You can see sharp stingers on the heels of their rear feet. And remember, they'll use them for self-defense. Poison Dart Frog A toad looks way more dangerous than this small, charming one that looks surprisingly beautiful, considering it's a frog. But in reality, a toad is just not that good-looking. It won't harm you, unlike a poison dart frog. There are over 100 poison dart frog species, and they all have different toxicity levels. The golden one is the most dangerous, that can take down 10 humans if they only touch it. A hedgehog has a special place in most people's hearts. Looking at this cute creature curling up like a little ball and running so innocently. But it's still a prickly animal that uses the spikes when it feels it needs to defend itself from something dangerous. Its quills can puncture your skin and well, that hurts. The anteater. With their warm benign eyes, anteaters look so harmless. They don't even have teeth to defend themselves and hurt us. But they do have claws. 
They mostly use them to get food, but they won't hesitate to use them when they believe you could harm them. Also, did you know their tongues are covered in spikes? Yup, that's their main tool for collecting food. And their tongue can be up to two feet long. It's long and narrow, so anteaters can easily maneuver it down into some pretty narrow spaces to look for termites and ants for lunch. Owls are not even that adorable, but they look so shy and clever. Plus, you'd never say they even pay any attention to you. But what can really make them mad is if you come closer and interfere with their nests. They have big, sharp claws, so it's not an animal you want to mess with. They can rotate their heads 270 degrees, so even if you're coming from their back, don't think they won't see you. Kangaroos aren't generally those animals that go around looking for trouble, but if you face them, they're not afraid to stand up for themselves and show you who's in charge. They can go after a human as if it's another kangaroo. Their arms are very strong, and they're even able to grapple with you with their forepaws. But it's way worse when they kick out with their hind legs. Deer look like they came from an idyllic fairy tale, but be careful. Males have antlers, and it can be tricky if you come too close and they perceive you as a potential threat. They also have a habit of trampling private gardens and eating what they find. They can be dangerous for some domestic animals people have in their backyards, especially dogs. Red foxes can't harm us looking like that, right? They can carry the rabies virus, so it's better not to interact with them too much, even though they generally avoid humans. They can be aggressive towards them and some small animals. They're pretty unpredictable, so be careful. Raccoons look friendly and cute, and it seems that the only trouble they can bring is turning over your trash can, but not quite. These little fellas are definitely not afraid to show their teeth when they sense something dangerous, even though it's just you going out to see what's making that noise in your trash can. And their little paws might be cute at first, but they're hiding sharp claws you wouldn't want to mess with. Tarsiers are among the tiniest and most adorable primates in the world. Although the first thing you'd want to do when you see one is to give them a hug, you better think twice. They're not outright dangerous, but they're not fans of humans trying to touch them, so they can react pretty neurotically if that happens. Better admire them from a distance. That's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like and share it with your friends. Or if you want more, just click on these videos and stay on the bright side.